There's my record button. We are recording and welcome. Good morning. I'm Carol. I'm the horticulture technician here, and we're going to talk about some different things about plant propagation. Obviously, seeds, you can divide plants, bulbs can easily be divided and so forth. We're going to talk a little bit about some of that, but I've brought some examples that people uh, sometimes think are the best ways to, to propagate, and they're not always the best way. Uh, one of the, the tools that we use here is a publication, and it will be uh, posted in the comments, Propagating Plants in and Around the Home. This is giving you the right information about the right type of cuttings, because a cutting from a tree is different than something that would be very herbaceous like uh, a, uh, a begonia or something that's uh, a little bit different like one of the different uh, aloes or, or other cacti and succulents. And we're gonna talk a little bit about all of that. Um, but this particular publication is kind of a, a handbook and a guide. So, I'll start with that because this is a wonderful tool and it's a great resource. Now, having said that, you don't have to go to a whole lot of expense. One thing I do recommend for almost all your cuttings is rooting powder. Now, what is rooting powder? Come a little closer so we can all see that. All right. Now, what that is, it's a compound that mimics the natural hormone in plants that's in the tip of plants because that's where they're growing. And uh, the woodier the stem, the less of that hormone is there. So if you're replacing it or you're jump-starting it by using the rooting hormone, that helps a whole lot. Another thing that I use quite a bit, especially during COVID, you may not go out to the restaurant to be able to sit and eat, but you might want something a little different. Well, carry out containers are perfect because they're usually not too deep and they come with great lids. So you can make your own little greenhouses for these cuttings. So this one's already loaded with soil. I do suggest clean soil. And I just cut this and opened it this morning. And what you're wanting is you're wanting this to be your nursery. You don't want soil that has fertilizer in it or has any other additives, bone meal or anything else. We're just wanting a clean potting soil mix. Once you pot it up and it has roots, then the plant has a way to actually take up those nutrients, fertilizers, soil amendments that that plant may need. So what we're trying to do is get them started. So we're going with the nursery idea first. Many people start plants in a little bit of water. Now, I apologize, this is not clear so you can't see through it, but the mug has water in it. An example, this is a pothis, uh, devil's ivy. It looks like a variegated philodendron and it's actually not, it's a syndapsis. But if you notice those little roots, it's been in there for a little over a week, these root nodes have swollen and this plant is getting ready to put roots out. It will actually root really well in water. Now, what else is in here? Ah, now, now I get to get my fingers wet. <laughs> oh, he fell in, of course it did. Uh, this is a mother-in-law's time. And I don't know how well you can see, but this is starting to degrade. This is too much water for this plant. So knowing going in that this was going to start to decay, I wanted you to see the difference. This is not putting out any roots. It was taken at the same time. This plant is not going to reproduce by water. And I'm going to set that aside, but I will put the, uh, the pothis back in the water and we can 
use him as an example. He's got a cool little crook in its, uh, its stem, so he hangs on really well. Uh, I did not do that, did it on his own. I think that plant is meant for great things. Now, what do you do if you want to start in soil? Because actually soil roots are stronger. Water roots are weaker. So you've got to be more careful when you transplant and you get roots in water. Uh, unless you're actually going for uh, producing in water, uh, in which case you have to have a whole set up for aquaponics and we're not gonna go there today. So when we're talking about cuttings, some plants tell you right away that they're ready. You've got a plant that will actually show you it's got these little hair-like roots, it's ready to go. Mama plant is saying, okay, off to college. She's wanting an empty nest. So you always clean sharp tools. You can use a knife or a pair of pruners. And when you cut, make sure that stem is just a little bit below those leaves. Now you can also take those leaves off gently if you'd like to have a little bit more room. And also the spots where those leaves came out will also be places where roots will grow. A little bit of powder, and I'm gonna put it on one of these plastic tops that were in the tray. I'm not going to reuse the powder. No, there it is. Because once I start dipping in it, something could start growing in it. It becomes contaminated. Now I can use it for what I'm doing today, it'll be fine, but I'm not gonna put it back inside my very clean rooting powder. And now you want just enough to dust it. I am not clumping it on. You do not want to dump this in water or dip it in water and then clump it on as if you were frying chicken. We're not doing that. All we're wanting is a little bit of dusting because this is going to mimic that hormone. Just think about it. You don't want massive amounts of hormone in your body. This particular cutting is needing enough to get started, but not enough to actually start to degrade this tissue and it can. So we wanna make sure that we just take a short little dip. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna put it straight in the soil. That simple. Now we have our nursery started. Now, this particular plant is a succulent and not all succulents have to be started that way. Many succulents, a leaf is all you need. And all these cells that are right here are able to put out roots. What happens to the mother plant once you make that cut, you see how it starts to regrow. So you can shorten those house plants or other plants that you have and then use those cuttings. Now with, again, with succulents, again, we're just dotting it, just a little bit of powder, if you notice. And then all we're going to do is stick it in and lay it against the soil. At this point, I will mist it daily to get it to root. Now, going back to the mother-in-law's tongue, if you cut it this way, surprise, surprise, not what you would think. If you cut it this way, and then we're going to dip it just right down again. We're gonna shake off any excess, and you'll notice there's just a little bit there. We are going to put that right in our nursery. And that's where, 
in about three or four weeks, we'll start seeing some of these come up. Now, a question that I have gotten from time to time is, I have roses from my mother's funeral. I have roses that somebody sent me. I have roses that mean a lot to me because they were sent to me by a friend, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, whatever. Many times, roses with blooms can, if you want to actually get rid of a bloom and sacrifice it. I have a piece of rose. And what I'm doing is I'm taking, these are brand new stems from this year. Now I'm cutting off what would be the bloom How right can there. can you tell that that's a brand new stem? It's soft tissued, it's green. It does not have this marked up darkening stem where I know that that is several years growth. And pardon the dripping. <laughs> but that kind of goes along with horticulture. Now, what I have is a couple of spots here. All of these leaves are gonna need water. They don't have any roots now. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna come through and we're gonna choose which start we're gonna keep. And right now, I really like the look of this one because I've got several leaves. So I'm gonna come in and on a long stem rose, you wouldn't have this many choices, but I'm going to come in and just literally with my fingernail, or you can take a pocket knife or a sharp kitchen knife and get it down to just one spot. And you're gonna do exactly the same thing. You're gonna dip it in a little bit of rooting hormone. And you notice I made the cut below where there was another bud. So all of these hormones hang out where there used to be leaves and where there used to be different branches and so forth. So what you're doing is you're putting just a little bit more of that hormone-like compound close to those places. It's gonna wipe that part of the plant up and say, okay, we need roots. And what we're gonna do, again, we're going to put that right down in. And when we're done, we're gonna cover this with some plastic to keep the humidity up. We don't want to stop airflow. But what we do want is to keep the humidity up because these plants are still gonna respire. They're still going to process gases and moisture through those leaves. So you keep the ground moist, not wet, and you put plastic, and this is, this is just a plastic bag at the dollar store. They came, I don't know, something like 20 in a, in a box. Uh, they have little twist ties, they're not the zip kind, but they're easily cut down the side and then you can drape it over anything you've got to make your own. And you'll notice this is not sealed, there's air movement. You can lift this up. And at this point I would use some type of water uh, spray bottle, something along those lines so that you're not disturbing roots. Now, another way to reproduce and propagate plants, the begonia that I have here, this is an angel wing. I love angel wing begonias because they come in all colors. They come in all sizes. They bloom beautifully. And uh, begonias just have a place in my heart. But if you take a leaf, and I don't know how well you can see what I'm doing here. Let me see if I can get one up front where you can see really well. I'm going to take that leaf. Can you see? Now, once you see the leaf, I want to show you. The leaves are a little bit hairy. They call that pubescence. Now, that little bit of hairy leaf Guess what all of those little hairs are gonna do? Once we put it in a little bit of hormone 
and we put it in the soil. Yeah, they're going to be roots. So what we're going to do, we're going to trim this up because this is kind of long, but I cut it off the plant so we wouldn't have any stubs on the plant. And now what I'm going to do is again, right inside the, the rooting compound. And I'm going to lay that again, right in the soil. And you can see that will not take very long at all because those little hairs, if the plant was growing in the wild, when those leaves touch the ground and they've got those hairs on them, that's how they asexually reproduce. Not to get into a big sex ed class, but if you're working with seed, it's sexual reproduction. You've got to have male and female parts. You've got to have pollen. They've got to pollinate and all that. This, you don't have to worry about seed coats. You don't have to worry about whether or not it's a hybrid, whether or not it's sterile or anything like that. You're getting a clone of the mother plant. And that's what we're trying to do here is without having to buy another one, or if you're wanting more than one of something you've fallen in love with, or you just want to reproduce more of them because you want more than one or two in your landscape, then that's what this is for. The next thing you can do is you can divide plants. Now we're gonna set our nursery aside. Should we see if anyone has any questions? Yeah. On this part? On the cuttings? Yeah. Does anyone okay. have any cutting questions before we move on to plant division? Putting, putting the cat back on my rooting powder right now. One question I have is about the rooting hormone. Um, is that available at like local nurseries and garden centers? I don't normally uh, recommend anybody specific, but if I found it at Home Depot, I'm sure Lowe's has it. I know your better nurseries do. So matter of fact, your better nurseries will probably have one for herbaceous plants or soft tissue plants and wood for one for woodies. Mm. It just means that formulation is a little bit different. If you were taking a cutting off of a tree, off of a, a woody shrub, you might need something that might be formulated a little bit different mm. so that it gets into that woodier, harder to actually break into that barky tissue. Now I'm not talking about five year old branches. I'm still talking about same year branches, but they're a little bit woodier, just like the bottom of the rose was. And because of that, <clears throat> sometimes that, that woody hormone uh, is a better choice. If you can't find anything else, Go with one that just says rooting powder. That's going to be mostly for herbaceous, but that will at least get the process started. But if you know you're gonna be working with trees or woodies and you have the, the choice of the two, that would be the difference. This is not obviously the exact hormone from the plant, but it is a compound made to mimic it and to produce auxins, which are plant hormones, that are responsible for growth, blooms, uh, all of the things that get triggered within the plant. Um, it's a chemical communication. And basically you're telling the plant, grow roots. And we're gonna give you a big shout out by using the powder, grow roots. But yes, there, it's easily found. now. I have not seen it at big box stores and I have not seen it like at Walmart or Myers, but they could have it. You may find it at Rural King, Tractor Supply and things like that, mm -hmm. but it is readily available. Awesome. Other questions that folks have about um, starting plants before we move on? All right, if you think about one later, drop it in the chat or shout it out and we will answer it. The next thing about propagating, many times, now this is me personally, but I'm passing this on to you. When I look and choose plants, I choose rather than the biggest one, I choose one that has pups already. Now you can see there are three pups here. Can you see that? 
Let me get, uh, an, over, can, let me get an overhead. So there. We can, oh, that's much better. Yeah. Yeah. Now this one actually bloomed. You can see what's left of the bloom stock. And they usually bloom in spring. Most of your, uh, there are a couple of things like everlasting, some of the euphorbias that will bloom in fall. But uh, most of your, your succulents that are closer to cacti are going to bloom in the spring. If you were right now in uh, Utah, in the desert areas, Arizona, and things like that, these plants would be getting ready to, to bloom. Now, with this particular one, because I've got three in it, and you can see it's divided to the point where it's actually made the pot go wonky. It wasn't going to live in this pot for very long anyway. It's, you can see, it has really distorted the, the pot. So it needs to be divided. Anything in the alo family, and this is definitely an alo, it just happens to have spikes and the ones we use uh, for health reasons usually don't, although they may have little tiny spikes. Uh, usually uh, a regular air of aloe vera does not. Now, when we start to divide this, we know we need to take some roots with it. And you'll see there are roots available, but it's not to the point where it's all roots. So it could have lived for a little bit in there. It was just gonna to start to make the plant start to look a little bit on the distorted side. So the plant wasn't going to grow completely straight. So what we're going to do is we're going to divide one of these pups or one of these plantlets. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a sharp knife in between. The center one is actually the parent plant. How do you know that that's the parent plant? Well, two reasons. If we could take all the soil off, and I'm not going to do that because this plant is actually going to be really, really stressed. Uh, and last night I dropped it by mistake <laughs> and I really don't want to stress it anymore. Uh, but if we took more of the soil off, you will see that the stems and the bigger roots are of the plant in the center. Now, when they planted it at the nursery, it probably had one small pup then it put out a second pup. Sometimes they'll do that when they're root bound. Sometimes they do it when they're getting ready to bloom. Sometimes something else in their environment will trigger. And this is literally, it's God and Mother Nature saying, let's reproduce a little bit so that the species keeps moving on and we still have the species. Although the parent plant may or may not survive, whatever triggered that. And that happens with a lot of different things. Now I'm gonna go ahead and cut the bloom suck off because it's starting to bother me and that's just me. Um, but when I cut this particular one off or I could cut this one, it doesn't really matter. Um, trying to get this so you can see where my knife is. Can you see where the mm -hmm. knife is? Yeah. I'm going to cut straight down. Now it's taking one third of the roots that are in the pot, a little less than a half for the parent plant. Now, if you notice, and I left some on that side. There we go. We have the parent plant you notice has really nice long roots. We're okay, we're fine there. This one, I'm gonna just move a little soil away so you can see. With aloes, they do much better. Don't cut the pup before it has some roots. And you can see there are a couple of really good, nice size roots. Now, yes, I have bruised it. And of course it got dropped last night, so it got bruised a little bit more. But I'm going to take it with a, a soil that is meant for cacti. Now, this is a little bit different. It's a soil that I have for cacti and succulents. If you look at it really closer under a microscope, 
it's got more sand and it's got more perlite, which is the white stuff. And that is to lighten it and to give it macro pore space so that those roots aren't sitting in any water every time you water it. So the plant itself reacts better to a soil that has that better chance of of draining well and still supporting the plant. Now I'm gonna take soil and just, I'm never planting this any deeper. This particular one, the other thing about getting it down to this point, you could see whether there were more pups actually coming off of this one, but there's not. And you'd wanna be very careful if there were. But with this one, it's just a matter of filling in around the plant and pressing, but you don't press hard. Um, a friend of mine in college used to press the roots so much you could hear them pop. Oh, that's where I know I've got it good and tight. She didn't have much of a green thumb. So uh, I don't suggest that you do that, but you do want to fully cover each of those roots. Now, on this topsoil, you could put, on top of this, you could put gravel. You could put any number of uh, types of sand, stones, something to make it very, very attractive if you were going to give it somebody, give it to somebody. And I always like to water down the center because these plants are made by God and Mother Nature to funnel water, moisture, in desert areas and things like that, as it condenses as dew in the morning, it funnels it down. It's the same thing that cacti spines do in ridges and cacti. If you've ever looked at a Sararo cactus up close, their ridges are perfectly designed to catch any kind of moisture in the air and funnel it down to the root system. So these plants adapt really well. And the one thing we wanna make sure is we don't over water it. And yeah, there's a little bit of water in the center here, but that's gonna dry up really quick. So this particular plant has been, of course, repotted. Now I'm going to take the other one with the two pups because I like the idea that there's two here. God and Mother Nature usually don't give us just two because that's equal. And usually we get them in odd numbers. But I kind of like the symmetry. So it's a personal thing. So I'm gonna take some of the soil that was here. And again, you'll notice it's got lots of perlite and such here. I am gonna take out old dead roots, that's not necessary. And then I'm just going to repot the plant. And that's that simple. And we can do the same thing with outdoor plants, with uh, plants that are in our landscapes, especially any of the stone crop, euphorbia, any of the sedums that are out there. They're easily reproduced uh, from cuttings or from division like this, of course, bulbs and so forth will. Uh, this time of year, after Easter, uh, there are a lot of plants that are produced for Easter. If you can get them for 50 cents or a buck, go ahead and plant those, uh, take care of them as house plants. But as soon as those leaves start to yellow on their own, plant them outdoors. Next year, they will bloom. And that's Easter lilies, hyacinths. Not all, but many tulips will. Now, I personally have a fight with tulips because there are some that are just too much of a diva that unless they're taken care of absolutely perfectly, they don't want to rebloom for you. And, um, and nobody's got time for that. I mean, if, you, if you're reproducing plants, I don't want to mess with it. But it's always worth trying. 
Uh, and especially if you've got any of the daffodils. Now, about the only thing that, that doesn't in the jonquil family do very well are paper whites. If you've got paper whites, throw them out. They are not, they have been really, really forced to bloom. They've been forced early and uh, they are not going to respond as well. So you wanna make sure, and that's getting of course into bulbs, but if you're going to try and reproduce them, they're really not worth the effort. Uh, because very rarely, not that you can't, but very rarely are they gonna produce the way you want them to. And again, a drink of water down the center of both plants. We know that that's going right straight to the root system. And I will set it right there since I used all of that soil. So how do you know when a plant is ready other than it is put out pups? If you want something like a ground cover, this is a sedum, similar to a euphorbia. And if you look close, again, we get a lot of close-ups on this one. Look at all of those roots that are just ready. So you have a choice. You can take this and cut it in fourths, pull it out of the pot, or you can break those off with one or two of those root hairs there and put them in the nursery. For instance, we have some really good examples. Can you see the roots there? Awesome. Well, I'm gonna prune right below that. And actually this doesn't even need any rooting hormone because this is already good to go. Look at all that. It's already got a root system. All it needs, it needs a little bit of soil. And in a week or two, I'm gonna have more of that sedum and it's gonna be ready to go. And if you did that to everyone that's showing roots, you'd have the mother plant that's still producing and you could have trays and trays and trays of these with two to three rosettes. And then within a year or so, a season, you've got an entire bed or you've got a whole pot, whatever it is that your end game is with the plant. Most of this works with house plants. The only thing with house plants is if you're working with something like a Dracaena that has just that single stalk with lots of, of uh, leaves that come out almost like grasses, then you can cut that top six inches or so, dip it in root hormone, strip some of the leaves off, and you can put that in a pot by itself because it's gonna be much larger. And uh, it will definitely uh, root. And then the parent plant where you cut that, trim that to right above other leaves, it will come out with one or two stems. And that's where you get these dragon trees and these corn plants that have side shoots, and then if you turn them to windows and so forth, you can get them to curl and you can play with some of these house plants. But it's not just house plants, like I said, it's other plants that uh, you have in and around your home and that can be outdoors as well. So that's pretty much it. I'm not gonna talk about grafting and things like that because that really needs to be hands-on and we don't have that capability right now. Uh, but uh, do keep in mind, Going back to the rose real quick, um, the top growth may not be as strong as the plant it came from. Many of the long stem roses are grafted onto really sturdy rugosa wild rose rootstock. And uh, that doesn't mean you won't be successful with it. It just means that the, the plant's going to look like that when it blooms. It's going to look exactly like it bloomed but it may be a little bit pickier. It may have some, as it gets older, may have some disease and insect problems that you wouldn't find with a knockout rose because knockout roses are not long stem roses. Long stem roses need a little bit more care. But, uh, but even knockouts 
I shouldn't say that because I, I don't know if they're still um, on copyright, although they've been out long enough, I don't believe they are. They could be. Do not sell them. Reproduce them for yourself. Do not sell them. Just to make sure. But they can be and many times are reproduced very easily. Are there any questions? If you are um, still pondering a lot of stuff at the moment, I am putting Carol's email and then also the phone number in the chat as well. Um, she can be <clears throat> reached at any time through email carol.wilder at uky.edu or Monday through Friday, 8 to 4.30 by phone, 502-569-2344. Oh, and then we have a question here. It says, are hydrangeas soft wood? Yes, they are. Now, I should say, older stems, no. The young stuff that is coming out now, you want to wait several weeks. That's one of the reasons why I wanted this class now, so you'd be prepared. We want the new growth that has come from buds now. You want as new as possible because all of that has all those raging hormones in it that the plant's actually gonna need for new rooting, leaf growth, and so forth. Some of those stems may produce a bloom and you may not wanna take that, that's fine. Go interior to the plant, to uh, one of the stems that does not have a bud, or if it's got a very small bud, cut the bud off because that bud's gonna use a lot of water and the plant won't have any root system for that, your cutting won't. But you can take the top four to six inches and that'll work fine. Leave two leaves at the top and uh, that would be fine. And again, you're gonna tint it, put a tint over it after you have taken your cutting, dipped it in a little root hormone and, and put it in clean soil. But yes, they can be done. And that way you have for a friend or for yourself, that second hydrangea, but yeah, hydrangeas, definitely. And sometimes for plants that do not bloom well or are sterile, it's the only way you're gonna get the plant is through a cutting. And that happens through mutations or through crossbreeding where you have a hybrid. And when that happens, the only way you're gonna get the plant is through a cutting. So this is done all the time in the industry commercially. Almost every mom that you ever see is started by cuttings. And they send them out by the hundreds or the thousands, depending upon the greenhouse. And they're all fresh cuttings, they're sent. Uh, and the person that, or the greenhouse that's getting it, gets it within 24 hours, they're potted up quickly. And within six weeks, you've got a plant that's got a bloom on it. So that's where a lot of greenhouses, of course, use this technique. They, uh, they keep their uh, stock plants. They're the ones that they take the cuttings off of. But, um, but cuttings have been used for many, many years in both the commercial and, of course, the private sector. If you do have questions about starting from seed or saving seed, I've got that information, but email me or call me. We did one of those earlier. It is online, but if you have questions, you can always give me a call about that. But this is a preemptive strike because right now, most of the uh, new tissue is pretty new. Now my rose had enough uh, actual new tissue to start. Uh, but it was a very early, uh, I hate to use the word early bloomer because it sounds like a pun, but, um, but in this case, it is true. Those buds broke really early. Roses are known for that. Um, it's an excellent time also to uh, prune them if you don't know that because now you know where the new growth is. 
and you can prune them so that those buds on the outside are uh, the ones that you save. So that that way you open up the rows so that there's less chance of disease or insects. And I could go on forever, <laughs> but you probably don't have time for that. But any other questions, I'll be glad to take. Well, with no more questions, we thank you. And of course, next Tuesday we'll be here and there'll be another garden Zoom class. And uh, we'll be glad to see you then. I can't wait. Lilies will be coming up at the end of the month. And that's gonna be, of course, talking about bulbs, but other bulbs as well. Uh, but a lot of people have questions about Asiatic lilies as opposed to, uh, Easter lilies and how that's different from day lilies and so forth. Because lilies um, actually is a really great name for a lot of plants that aren't necessarily in the same family. So we'll be talking about those as well. Thank you very much for coming in today. And as always, uh, don't forget we're here. We do not want to be uh, Jefferson County's best kept secret. We want to be out there and we want to help you be successful.